Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities. Welcome to another episode of the Smart City Podcast. Today we're broadcasting live from ARC. 26th Annual Forum here in Orlando, Florida. Uh, today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Darren Kimura of Zadida uh, to talk about edge devices and more specifically, edge management, um, edge device software platforms that would manage those, those terminal devices out in the field. So, Darren, welcome. It's great to have you. How are you today? I'm great. It is awesome to be here. Thanks for having us. Hey, that's, that's great. So let's just uh, let's get started with um, perhaps a little bit of background about uh, yourself, your company, and how did you come to this edge device ecosystem? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Darren Kimura. I'm the chief operating officer for Zadita. Um, my responsibility is, you know, running running the business uh, in all things um, uh, related to product, go to market, engineering, whatever the case may be. Um, Zadita has been around since 2016, and it's a really interesting company. First of all, oftentimes we get asked, what does the name Zadita mean? Because it's a pretty unique name. Um, our One of our founders, we have we have three founders with the company. One of the founders is from Morocco, and the word Zadita uh, pr- uh, translated means innovative or new. So we always think about what we do as being very, uh, at our core, needing to be very innovative. So that's what Zadita means. Uh, back in 2016, this is when, at a time when things were changing quite a bit. IoT was very big. Topics like fog computing was out there. Edge computing uh, was also out there. Um, and really, the definitions were quite loose. But the founders really saw an opportunity for cloud computing to change and be brought closer to where the workloads are, being Uh, For example, in a factory floor, you know, taking the compute and moving it all the way down to where the robot arm is and where the automation needs to be. And that was the idea, but the technology wasn't quite there yet. So what they decided to do was really work on the operating system level and figure out a way to make the different applications that are running in those locations, for example, the factory floor, work with the technologies of tomorrow, things like uh, AI, TensorFlow and whatnot, and and how do you bring all of this together? Uh, And and when they did that, what they developed was an operating system, a brand new operating system, very thin, very lightweight, designed for those applications, designed for the factory floor. Uh, What they then decided to do, which was really fascinating, was take that and contribute it to the open source. And as a result, bring a community in and around the technology to improve it, to support it, to make it better, bring use cases in. Uh, And really, that was kind of the legacy behind what Zadita is. The the next part that they did, and I'll keep this part really short because I know we want to get into a lot here today, but was they came up with a way to orchestrate it because one of the things we recognized was you're not just going to have one or two of those servers on the factory floor. You're going to have hundreds, maybe even thousands. So how do you go about managing it? So they developed a cloud-based orchestration system, which allows you to go down to each, each one of those devices very securely and control them and manage them and monitor them. And, and really, that's what Zadita has today, an open source operating system and a cloud-based orchestration system. Darren, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, we all know the world is evolving to open standardized protocols that which allow interoperability and frankly, applications to be developed that none of us could even dream of. But let's look a little more uh, foundationally at each of the building blocks of of an edge-based cloud fog type system. Um, What actually is an edge device? Um, I I, I know that some of our listeners may not be familiar with that, so just can we start there? Absolutely, that's a great place to start. So let me maybe explain the way we think about edge and, and the definition. So 
So if you think about like a triangle, at, at the very top of a triangle, you might start with cloud compute, the hyper-converged infrastructure providers like AWS, Azure, etc., GCP. The edge kind of starts at the next layer down. And what typically happens from an edge definition is you're gonna have your, your telco providers, your CDN providers, um, which will be your geographical data centers, which is really kind of where the beginning of the edge is. The next tier down, you're gonna have the edge, which will be probably something like an on-prem data center. If you have a factory, for example, and there's a data center there, the data center might be racked and cooled with UPS and whatnot. That would be your, your you know, kind of like an edge um, data center, but on-prem. And the next tier down is what we call the distributed edge. And this is gonna be devices like gateway devices or small servers that you might have running inside machines. Um, so these are, you know, not your typical one U, two U type servers, but smaller than that. They might be self-cooled, solid state. They might be a non-racked, you mount them on the ceiling, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and really that's where we think about the distributed edge as, as playing in. So those servers could be anywhere. They could be in solar farms, running trackers. They could be in cars. If you think about autonomous vehicles, like a Tesla, for example, that's also an edge server running inside of that Tesla. That's also an edge device. So the form factors vary depending on what the use cases are, but, but really all of that is edge. <clears throat> Just to clarify for our audience, you, you now introduced a few new terms, distributed edge server. Mm -hmm. um, when a more commonly used term that I'm familiar with is simply an edge device. Mm -hmm. So does, do these distributed edge servers, are they one step up in a hierarchy above the standalone, let's go not, the standalone sole function edge device? I think they're the same. So I would think about an edge device as being a broader category and the distributed edge type server to be a subset in that broader category. So the distributed edge server is gonna be your smaller, like a gateway, for example. You could have a gateway there, which would be more on the distributed because it's all over the place. You're gonna have, you know, perhaps one in each of the, uh, one of the uh, industrial processes, for example, um, but small. So, but they're all generally of the classification of edge edge device. Okay, so <clears throat> we've talked about that architecture. Um, let's let's just mm, talk about uh, some edge device applications. Yeah. And I, I, as you know, before we started recording today, you and I had talked about uh, license plate reading cameras. I think that that's a um, a very good example of a sole use, sole application um, edge device. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what's the value proposition of something like that? Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the interesting thing about edge is it's kind of everywhere. So it's not any specific sector, it's pretty much every sector. So what we've seen quite a bit is, for example, in the retail markets where you have um, camera systems which today are digital and they have some common server on site, you know, all the different cameras, maybe you have 90 cameras out there, all connected back to some server. Um, what you cannot do is you cannot take each of the frames from those cameras and push it all the way up to the cloud, right? It'd be very prohibitive to do that, very expensive. You would, you know, clog your pipes, it could be very um, difficult on the other side to receive all of that information. So what you ideally probably wanna do is you wanna run local compute to be able to take all of that information and scrape it for whatever it is that you're looking for. So one example is uh, license plates on vehicles where these cameras are just, streaming data, they're, they're capturing frames all the time, but when you actually see a car enter into a, a picture, for example, into the camera itself, you can use machine vision or some form of artificial intelligence to really begin to hone in on identifying the license plate of that vehicle. When you can capture it, you can OCR that, get that information, send that back, you know, captured in your edge compute device locally on site, take that license plate information and shoot that back up to the cloud. So now from the cloud, you can actually go in and take a look at all the different vehicles, for example, and all the different license plates that have entered and, and exited that parking lot or that intersection. Um, but, but really, if you think about the, the entire description I just made, all of the heavy data is actually there still on site. That's a great example. And in fact, I would point our listeners to, to a podcast we recorded yesterday here at the ARC Forum with uh, Blue Skies AI who has a, an artificial intelligence-based inspection system for uh, medical supplies, and, um, and it actually was originated at Intel for semiconductor um, testing. Uh, 
and so there's a in that application there's a tremendous amount of processing horsepower that's looking at misalignment of medical products as they're coming down the assembly line mm. and uh, the AI is a, is, a, is a, um, applied and the only message that's sent is pass or fail in the, in that case mm -hmm. um, in the license plate reading um, application it's typically seven characters six or seven ca alphanumeric characters that are sent back to the state regulatory folks and then the state would uh, via the cloud report back uh, stolen vehicle mm -hmm. no insurance or, or, or something similar to, to that so what are the challenges in in the uh, in edge device development and in particular the management? I think one of the largest challenges probably is managing these disparate devices that are all over the place on different media, uh, different geographies, uh, and some probably come and go on the network as well. Yeah, those are you, you hit on a bunch of key points there. One of the things we're we're working hard to solve as Adidas is how do you migrate a organization that's been running their systems for the last 20 years, probably on some, you know, Windows uh, application and modernize it so that you can now run things like artificial intelligence right next to it. Um, and that's quite a challenge because, again, the data and the quantity of data, the, the gravity, the volume is is local. So what we have, for example, in the operating system that we, we produce is the ability to actually run multiple runtimes side by side. And why that's important is now that allows you to take a physical server, um, a, a device that, you know, the end user may like and a, a brand they may trust uh, and take the Windows application that they've been using for the last 15 years, run it next to something in Linux where they might have a proprietary application, maybe doing something like preventative maintenance, for example. So that allows them to gently transition into this new digital world, but using stuff, applications in this case that they're very familiar with. That, that's one of the biggest challenges is the leap to go from, you know, your traditional on-prem environment into the new uh, cloud, for example, world, pretty, pretty great. And, and allowing them to take these baby steps to get there is significant. Um, so the learning curve is lower. The, the amount of uh, instrumentation goes down quite a bit. It's cheaper to do it this way as well. So there's a lot of advantages for, for this approach. So this, this application resides in, the, in, in your application in the cloud or in the device? Itself? Yeah, it's actually both. So what, what we do with the edge orchestration and uh, the um, edge uh, operating system we have is we can take an application which you wrote for AWS or Azure or any other cloud implementation, port it down into the Zadita marketplace. Uh, it's designed to be able to port very easily with very little, if none, work. Uh, and then run that application physically on that edge server that you might have on the factory floor. So now that application can do local processing, but you're also still able to take the information you want and process it also in the cloud. So the heavy lifting can be done locally, and then the, the high-level analytics, the Power BI, et cetera, can be done in the cloud. So the low latency applications can be done out there in yeah. the field, and the, and the heavy data mining could be done that's less time dependent can be done back home on the cloud yeah, or vice versa or vice versa because again when you have a lot of the data you might want to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting uh, physically on site and then you know extract the high value information and push that up but then you aggregate that across all of the different locations that you have so it's just a higher level view a bird's eye view of your data that's fascinating i know in, in particular in the in the traffic signal industry uh, in the last decade, they've moved to a Linux operating system, mm -hmm. and there are now a number of applications that, diagnostic applications, all yes. types of different applications that reside there. And the interesting part there is now that data gets shared across those the two of those, or three or four applications, and again, you start getting applications created that no one has really even uh, conceived of. Yep. Yeah, and that's happening on the regular now. I mean, we have organizations that are running proprietary applications, things like uh, lightning strikes and trying to calculate where the lightning strikes are or weather patterns. These are not applications that are made publicly available, but proprietary. And we have to be able to enable them to use that side by side next to open uh, applications, which might be doing things like firewalls, you know, for example. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, there's, there's, there's certainly is a plethora of those gunshot detection. And yes. Things, Good example. Th things like that. Yeah. The, uh, the gunshot detection is fascinating that every gun model has actually has a unique signature. So you could even identify the actual type model of gun that's been fired. Yep. 
Um, so what about, again, let's, let's go back to some of those challenges and in particular, how, how does your organization, you know, surmount those? What makes, what makes your offering unique? Yeah, I think, um, the big question is, you know, what about security? And, and that's a top of mind for any large organization when they're working in the cloud, but just in general, right? Security is such a key topic these days. Um, we start with security at our core. So when we're looking at how do we go about creating a secure connection, we're, we're, we're all the way down to the silicon. Now, we don't make hardware. We work with over 70 different hardware models out there from the major manufacturers. We connect to TPM, for example. When we uh, initially install the operating system on a piece of uh, bare metal, we're looking at the way that that server is designed, the BIOS of it. We're looking at every single line of code as it boots. We take all of that information and we connect it back to our cloud. That creates a secure connection via encryption uh, in transit and at rest. And every time afterwards, when that device is connected to the cloud, we match it. We call that remote attestation. And, and if the device doesn't connect correctly, we do not allow it to connect to your network. We allow it to run so you can be quote unquote offline, but not necessarily connected. So for example, if someone went into that, that, uh, ed server and, and a lot of these distributed servers are going to be like little boxes sitting on top of someone's desktop or wherever the case may be, you might have a USB port there. Someone could have inserted a USB key and that may have malware on it. Uh, if that, and you wouldn't have any idea because a lot of these sites may be autonomous, unmanned. Um, so you wouldn't have any other idea except for the fact that when it tries to remotely attest itself to our cloud, we know, hey, something happened, something changed, um, so it's been spoofed. Uh, and when we see that, we, we let you know that. We let the user know that, hey, you need to know this so you can go out there and proactively take action before you connect it to your network and take everything down. So we start with security at, at the beginning. And then we take a look at things like usability. Um, most of our customers have tens of thousands of different node devices. But the last thing you want to do is physically send a technician out to every single site, plug in a laptop to bring that device up, configure it, and then have to send that technician back out there every time there's a software update. So we allow you to be able to create a image of what you want, software, application, whatever the case may be, and, and attach it to a particular device or cluster and be able to push that down. So now one admin is able to manage tens of thousands of nodes around the world and ensure that it's running in the exact way you want it with the right applications that you want it to be running with. So, you know, allowing for that, that ease uh, and one touch provisioning, such a big uh, game changer for, for our customers. What, um, let me just ask, what markets have you, um, are you participating in? Yeah, you know, oil and gas has always been a, a leader in IoT and edge, and they continue to lead, particularly these days with, with oil prices as they are and more exploration needed. So we're seeing just tremendous activity in that market. Um, industrial and manufacturing, you know, process automation, like what we see a lot here at, at Arc Forum, um, you know, many of the end users here are exactly the types of organizations implementing edge computing now because they're trying to modernize, they're trying to automate, they're trying to make their systems more robust and redundant. Um, you know, this is this is a gold mine for, for companies doing edge computing, in my, in my opinion. And then we're seeing things like uh, autonomous now, you know, AWS or Amazon warehouses, which run autonomous forklifts and drones. Um, each one of those, those systems is an edge device. Each one of those drones has an edge device in it. Each one of those Tesla's out there on the road. So automotive is really picking up quite a bit right now as well, but it's everywhere. Um, EV charging stations, as I mentioned, solar farms, it's pretty much edge computing is absolutely everywhere now. That's, that, that is fascinating. Well, it's an open, open API protocol. Yeah. Do you need functional profiles from those device manufacturers or do you code those yourself or how does, how does that work out? Yeah, two ways. So it, it definitely helps when we have a relationship directly with the hardware providers because uh, exactly to your point, each one of these devices, even in the same model class, there could be little differences that make them tricky. Um, so if we have that and we have a relationship as the model is being produced by the vendor, we can work with them to make sure that Eve is going to work with them. But but the second way and probably the most powerful way is the community. 
because Eve, Eve stands again for the edge virtualization engine, it's the operating system which, which I've been describing, is actually in the open source under Linux Foundation. We have an active community of over 10,000 uh, contributors who are working on these things. They're working on interoperability of hardware. They're working on, you know, using Eve in new and unique ways. Um, and, and that's a totally open source um, world out there. Well then, let's let's go into in some of the technical details there about um, you know if if you do if, if if a supplier shows up with a new edge device you've never seen before yeah how do you know the arrangement of the objects in there um, what kind of definition files might they provide or how or how does a supplier go about like engaging. With uh, Zadita, yeah. Um, one way is that we they directly engage with us, so they become a registered supplier with Zadita, um, and we get them to you know tell us the types of models that they have. A lot of times, they have a virtual image of what that looks like, and what we try to do is we try to put Eve on it, and we see how that works. That allows us to identify bugs or inconsistencies, and and from there we can actually begin to work on the patches or whatever needs to be done to make that work. So that's what we typically do is we would rather start with having a direct engagement with the vendor, know what they offer, get access to their their images and work with them directly. But it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes it happens by an end user who has a device um, and is in the in our open source community. We don't even know, as Adida doesn't even know that they're out there. What they'll do is they'll try to put Eve on it themselves and then through the community, they'll submit what they're trying to do and where the problems exist. Um, and, and oftentimes we have people on, on the regular basis at Zadita looking at the uh, communication there as well. We'll drop in and we'll try to help out if we've seen the situation before, um, if we've seen the patch or fix or whatever that needs to happen there before we can directly get involved with that. Um, and, and, and that happens, like I said, naturally because of the open source nature of what we do. We don't oftentimes even know. Now, once we do know, of course, we do then try to make a relationship with the vendor so that we can continually be ahead of the curve. So as they're coming out with a new GA of a product, um, we want it to work. Um, and, and as I think we continue to get bigger as an organization and more well-known, um, I think that'll become more of the normal course of business. So is there a um, certification process that um, this is a good citizen on the Zadita network? Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And who, ma who manages that? Uh, so we have the Zadita official um, devices. We call this the approved device list, and that's a certification for devices we've seen before, we've worked with, we know that will work um, consistently with our, our solution. Then we have our community device list, which is basically a list of uh, devices that have been reviewed and, and um, submitted by the community to have worked. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing this is, I'm intuiting that this is not a trivial scenario. Um, you know, I, the, the first, um, Analog, I think of is you know, SNMP and, and MIBs, yeah. where where you get MIB, you know it's SNMP IP address, and it pretty much works. But um, you, here you have a plethora of different silicon providers and operating systems in those terminal devices that uh, makes this a non-trivial situation. It's true. I would say though, SNMP is, uh, while it's supposed to be a standard, is very unstandard <laughs> for anyone who's worked in networking. So as a result, uh, you know, having come from the networking industry myself, I know that can be also very challenging. But, but to your point, absolutely. Each one of these devices are configured in a different way. The chips are different. The IOs are different. So there's oftentimes a little bit of work that we have to do. But, but, after you know having been around for about six years we've seen a lot of the variations in the past so it, the fixes come pretty quickly now very good um well, darren what what do you see for the future of edge devices in general and edge device management platforms in particular you know the the future is um very exciting as we look at what end users are trying to do they're pushing edge now to be even beefier than it, what it used to be. So a lot more compute, a lot more cores, for example, allowing them to do more things, um, multiple run times running in parallel to each other. So you can now do things like AI next to, you know, frame grabbing with machine vision and automation. Um, so just more, uh, more, autonomy, I, I think, that you're going to see from these systems. Um, what I'm really excited about is the end-to-end -end nature of what we're seeing. 
you know, organizations now that are looking to deliver um, complete solutions, uh, AI solutions, for example, without data science, no code or low code type offerings, but embedding uh, the Zadita platform in there to become the operating system of, of use. Uh, and then also the, the orchestrator of choice. Um, which is what we're trying to do. We're not trying to compete with anyone making an application. We're trying to enable the infrastructure so those applications can be made. Now, one point we didn't we didn't discuss here is, um, you know, as I'm thinking about your platform, it's it's uh, frequently used by end, the end user community, uh, an oil refinery, yep. process controls. What does the user interface look like, and what about usability for folks that are not? Do they need to be edge device gurus? Yeah. Yeah, they, they have to be edge device gurus. No, 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 I'm joking. Because <laughs> no, no, there's no such thing. Um, not yet, anyway. And maybe there are. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and we'd love to meet them, by the way. But, but for the most part, edge is so new that you have to make it simple because the definitions even still are, are being you know, worked on. So what we offer is through the uh, Zadita Cloud, we have a very familiar type of UI. It's very intuitive, doesn't require any training. Um, you can figure out uh, by yourself, step by step on how to do it. But of course we have the documentation as well to set up a device, manage a device, deploy an application, monitor its health. Um, and we do that through through our cloud. But in addition to that, we offer over a hundred different APIs uh, from our Edge engine, which allows our customers to take those APIs and run that into their own cloud. So for example, some of our, our customers have their own UI, which they run different types of analytics across their systems and they ingest information via API from Zadita into that UI. So we're, we're it's like Zadita inside. We're, we're behind the scenes providing them all of the information, the configuration control, but we're not, um, you know, they're not necessarily logging into Zed control by itself. Well, Dar Darren, thank you. This is this has really been a very fast half hour and, um, of demystifying what is an edge device, edge, edge, manage, edge device management platforms, um, do you have any um, last minute parting words for our audience? Yeah, you know, I think um, what we're trying to do at Zadita is uh, really be a thought leader as it relates to all things edge computing. So one thing we recently launched is what we call the Edge Academy. And the Edge Academy has a lot of Zadita information, but a lot of stuff just in general about Edge. If you want to get smart about Edge, just learn about what it is. You should go there. You can get access to the Zadita Academy for free. We make that resource available for free. Um, just simply go to zadita.com, Z-E-D-E-D-A.com, uh, and get access to it from there. Also on our website, a lot of white papers. We sponsor a lot of stuff not necessarily related to Zadita, things like the State of the Edge uh, annual report where we talk uh, with over 100 to 150 different major end users around the world and get their views on where the future is gonna go, what they're investing in. That's also available for free. All of these resources are available for free on our website. That's, that's just fascinating. Thank you for, for, for all of that. Uh, lastly, if any of our listeners would like to contact you, how do they actually find Zadita? We make it easy. Just go to the Zadita website and you can get uh, access to us, contact us, find any one of us uh, at any given point in time. Um, we're there to help. Well, again, we our, our guest today has been Darren Kamara, COO of Zadita. And thank you very much, Darren. This has been see you soon. This has been awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, great. Great. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you, everybody. We look forward to seeing you on another episode of the Smart City Podcast. Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities Podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities. Thank you.